get the basic idea, I think. So, all right, so, so let's get to the heart of the matter. Her first speaker will be Professor Neil Katanda, who is a professor at law at Western State College of Law, is an award-winning mentor and teacher. He was an original participant at the Critical Legal Studies Conference, um, a co-founder of the Critical Race Theory Conference. He developed some of the early iterations of Asian American jurisprudence and indeed is credited what, with what Neil Gatan, with what, sorry, with what Bob Chang describes as an Asian American moment. Professor Gatanda writes extensively in the area of critical race theory, Asian American jurisprudence, and critical theory. His work is foundational to critical race theory, and I'm thinking particularly about his Stanford Law Review article on American constitutionalism and colorblindness, his UCLA article on comparative racialization, and his co-edited volume with Kimberly Crenshaw, among others, on critical race theory, the key writings that formed the movement. Professor Gatanda will start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. Uh, significantly, he read several early drafts of the Whiteness as Property article. We won't ask him to describe the substantive content of that draft. That might test his memory and Professor Harris's patience. Um, what we'll ask him to do instead is say something about the CRT workshop and the extent to which that created conditions of possibility for collaborative work and for scholars like Cheryl to rehearse her idea. He will also interrogate the whiteness in whiteness as property and do so to think comparatively about genealogies of black subordination and Asian subordination. Please join me in welcoming Professor Neil Gatanda. <laughs> I'll just wait at you. <laughs> oh, that's, that's later. Don't worry. Don't worry. Just, just go back to the beginning. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you for the very kind introduction. It, it is, of course, um, an enormous honor and an enormous pleasure to be here at UCLA, where so much of the critical race uh, um, uh, theory discussions conference um, took place um, in various offices scattered around this building. Um, and um, Devin, as, um, as, as he indicated, efficient and organized as always, um, suggest, made that very suggestion that since I'd read and worked, read early drafts, worked with uh, Cheryl and others in the early um, formative uh, meetings around critical race, uh, what came to be known as critical race studies, um, I should offer, perhaps I could offer some context about how this developed. So uh, I tried, I, I, I really tried, I, I thought about it. I went back and I read the article again carefully. Um, and I, I came up with some in, uh, recollections of very intense conversations at conferences and different events, uh, crit CLS events, critical legal studies events, uh, and, and other places. Um, I, I remember, uh, I had some great recollections of hanging out in Chicago um, and, and hearing some neighborhood blues band that was really fun and indulging in some wonderful ribs. Um, <laughs> but when it came to trying to recall the content of our discussions, um, I, I just drew a blank. So, um, so I, I'm afraid that I can offer a little bit uh, about uh, some of the context. So, um, I, so what I'm going to do is offer just an, a reflection uh, about uh, a critical race, the Critical Race Project in the early 90s, uh, and then um, a speculation uh, about how the methodologies uh, of whiteness as property uh, the notorious um, WAP um, might be extended to my own project, um, that of Asian Americans. So, um, uh, looking back, one dimension of the uh, critical race project uh, was a version of using the master's tools. Um, we sought to engage our own experiences and understandings of racial subordination um, within and through uh, legal doctrine and uh, we were deeply inf influenced by two traditions. First, Derrick Bell's radical rethinking of race and civil rights. Uh, and second, the spirit of legal realism and the critical legal studies movement. 
that politics, power, and ideology prefigured and participated uh, within and through legal doctrine. Um, in that context, uh, and even today, uh, whiteness as property is a singular work uh, in the investigation of race and law. Uh, the principal legal terrain for analysis then in law, um, as was suggested by Devin's um, um, wonderful introduction, um, uh, was um, uh, constitutional and public law, equal protection, due process, civil rights legislation. Um, however, while whiteness as property does engage equal protection, uh, what it seems to me as most striking about the article is that it engages the common law, it engages property. Right? And uh, from the critical legal studies tradition, uh, property and, common, uh, and the common law are foundational to legal ideology, and as we all know, property is central to the law school curriculum, right? and therefore the, the ideology of legal education. So it's a project that, to the best of my knowledge, no one has undertaken in quite such an ambitious, thoughtful, uh, theoretical fashion to address um, this core function and area uh, of our legal ideology. And again, not the public law dimensions, uh, but it, at the common law, uh, at this common law subject, uh, which remains um, a, a hidden and uh, uh, a hidden dimension to project. Well, what can I say? We had, we had lots of energy and enthusiasm. We were all a lot younger. Um, there was the discovery of kindred intellectual spirits, uh, the efforts to build a community, uh, and again, all with the sort of illicit pleasure uh, that we were using the master's tools. We were using law uh, to expose race and racial subordination uh, and provided a, a, a wonderful sort of sense uh, of uh, um, oppositional community, of being, uh, of being intellectual outlaws uh, in the legal academy uh, offers a certain kind of charm, uh, a certain kind of you know, uh, attraction. Um, but then perhaps in spite of our critical uh, intellectual perspective, uh, um, we were perhaps a little too respective of the institutions of the judiciary and legal education. So uh, in, in going back over, if you look at my article, at Whiteness's Property, at, at Chuck Lawrence's article, we all talked about affirmative action. We all tried to address Richmond versus Croson, Patricia Williams' piece, piece articles. We, we, we all tried to engage on, on that intellectual and legal terrain. And, and of course, you can see how successful we've been uh, <laughs> in terms of the court's uh, uh, politics and doctrines. So um, uh, had we asked, Derek would have, had we really asked and sort of said, well, you know, do you think we can really change something? Derek probably would have quickly put us straight. Uh, critical studies emphasis on politics and power also should have been a cautionary note. Um, but our work continues. Uh, today, the terrain of investigation in, in terms of um, um, uh, the project of the broader project of uh, critical investigations of race, um, uh, we can see th from the breadth. Uh, of the program uh, and the work of the critical, uh, critical race studies program here, uh, the various speakers, that uh, the terrain of investigation um, is broad and vast. Um, but the initial political challenge is still with us. Right? How do we engage legal doctrine, legal authority, legal power from within the academy? So I don't really have an answer, um, but I will offer a speculation. Uh, on some of the methodologies used in whiteness as property, as extended to my own critical race project, Asian Americans. Now, I ask you to be a little patient and indulgent with me. Uh, I've been at this for a long time. I, I taught my first course in Japanese Americans and the law in 1971 at San Francisco State. Uh, and my first publication on Asian Americans was in 1985. So it, it's something that, you know, sort of is on my mind. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, so I, I suggest that we might use um, the methodologies of whiteness as property uh, to examine uh, race and racialization uh, in, in a comparative format. And so this might be illustrated uh, by mixing the title. So instead of whiteness as property, I, I, I would uh, interrogate Asian American whiteness and property. 
Hmm. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> okay. So uh, 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 um, this is sort of an examination of what happens to our analysis if we posit that the reification of whiteness into property may take multiple forms. So to see how these speculations might be examined, um, consider the recharacterization uh, of race and racialization to a racial genealogy. I, I use this broad term. And um, uh, uh, after Omi and Wenant, uh, Michael Omi is on it later on in, in the conference, going to be speaking in the conference, uh, we are all racial constructionists. So consider um, uh, the slide. Can you give me the next slide? Okay. All right. Um, everything here is recognizable. Um, some of this is part of the whiteness as property article. Uh, it, it, it is uh, a, an examination, a sort of roughly historical uh, reference to history. Uh, I left that culture, um, but you can insert all of those other moments as well. Um, and, and sort of placed like this, we can see um, um, a, a sort of deep sense of what race has meant in terms of white and black in America. <coughs> Next slide. Now, um, if we talk about Asian Americans, we, we come up with a very different set of considerations. Um, Orientalism prefigures the arrival of significant number of Asian bodies in, 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 the in, in America. Um, 1850s to 1880, that's Chinese labor, Chinese exclusion. 1898, the Spanish-American War. That is, um, and the annexation of Hawaii, the Philippines, and of course Puerto Rico, Guam. Uh, uh, a very uh, a different history. Um, Asian exclusion, the, racial, the, thin, well, uh, the thinned and Ozawa cases um, that Devon has uh, addressed, uh, uh, the racial bar to naturalization, um, Japanese internment, uh, 1965, the invention of the model minority, new Asian immigrant, and 9-11, the Islamic terrorist. Um, this is a very different racial genealogy than the one for African Americans. Um, and if you reinsert this, so give me the next slide. If you put these next to each other and just sort of say, well, um, what kind of whiteness emerges uh, opposite uh, the Asian Americans? Um, uh, it, we come up with a very different sort of answer. Now, I, I was going to offer um, a, a little example, um, Wen Ho Lee. Uh, the Chinese-American physicist who was charged with being a spy, where the case was so thin that a Republican-appointed district court judge dismissed the case with an apology mm -hmm. to Lee. Um, but uh, notions of being, of being a spy, and, and who, who is the opposite of uh, the presumption, the racialized presumption of being a spy, um, uh, the notions that there can be uh, an enjoyment out of watching someone uh, be the object of this prosecution and notions of uh, entitlement and uh, 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 consumption of properties. Uh, and of course, as a foreigner, the right to exclude, a corollary notion of property theory, uh, the right of exclusion. So uh, the suggestion is that we could take some of uh, the methodologies and uh, uh, that heresy used uh, in whiteness as property, re-examine in a comparative framework uh, uh, the considerations, and of course there's an equally interesting one to be done with Latinos and, and Native Americans as to exactly what happens when we pursue this as comparative uh, racialization in terms of racial genealogies. So what do I suggest? Um, I think that from, um, that some, we can take some of our guidance from the justices of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, justices are now rock stars. Uh, it's much more fun, I think, um, the, the very appearance of Justice Scalia uh, in our, our little video snip. Uh, justices are now rock stars. It's much more fun and perhaps more informative to see where Justice Scalia will be giving his next presentation and examine his audience, uh, 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 or we can read the interview with Justice Ginsburg and see if she's revised her list of the five worst Supreme Court decisions. Right? Do we take seriously the grand doctrinal pronouncements coming out of the court's mouth? Uh, or do we remember the admonitions of the realists in critical legal studies, power, politics, and ideology? Uh, do we recall Derek's fearlessness to follow race and subordination no matter where it leads? Um, uh, for now, we have uh, with us a model, Whiteness as Property, uh, and its wonderful author, Cheryl Harris, uh, to provide us with an inspiration. Thank you.